Good morning, church family. Liam Ochetwe, Momochai, Siana Magalaya Rooted Fellowship. Welcome by Jans Kak and welcome to church one and all. My name is Jono and uh, I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Rooted Fellowship under our lead pastor, Pastor One Mokhatle. It's a, it's a privilege for me to spend some time with y'all this morning and open up God's word before you. For the past four weeks, as a church, we have been in the book of Judges. And Pastor One has navigated us brilliantly through this difficult book that we find in our Old Testament. We've covered four parts. In our Judges, hope for the horrific sermon series. But today we're going to be taking a break from that series. However, I'd like to think that whilst we are taking a break from our time in Judges, this message is still very much linked to those from the previous four weeks. It occurred to me that over the past four weeks, we have interacted with many different types of God's servants, right? Pastor One has taken us through numerous accounts of God's followers, his servants, or his stewards, and we've covered various accounts on how they responded to what God entrusted them with. We met Ehud, Deborah, Jael, and Gideon, to name but a few, and we saw that their faithful response to what God had called them to was. And ultimately, we have seen how they faithfully acted and responded to the calls and responsibilities that God entrusted them with, right? We saw how they faithfully acted and responded to the calls and responsibilities that God entrusted them with. And today we're going to dive into some of Jesus' words from the Gospel of Matthew on what God is faithfully calling you and me to. And so this morning, if you have a Bible, please meet us in Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. And I'm going to be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. That's Matthew 25, verses, 1 to, verses 14 to 30. It'll be in your Bible and, of course, up on the screen. You can follow along. Verse 14. Jesus says, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two talents. And to another, one talent. Depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two talents earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached presented five more talents and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I, I know you. You're a harsh man reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So, so I was afraid and went off and hid your talents in the ground. See, what you have is, is yours. His master replied to him, you evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given. 
and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good for nothing servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Family, this is the word of the Lord, and so thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy, faithful, good God, we come before you this morning as your people adoring you for your faithfulness, praising you for your faithfulness, acknowledging that you are our good, good Father. Thank you, Lord God, that in your wisdom you sent Jesus into this world to pay the price for our sins so that we may know you, Lord God, so that we may love you, and Lord God, so that we may fellowship with one another. We pray, Lord God, for this time now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come now and use this time. Use this time to speak your truth, to build your church. Lord God, come and speak your truth into our hearts, into our minds, into every crevice of our souls, Lord God. May this word saturate us with your truth. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would use me now to speak your words. Come and have your way in us. Come, Holy Spirit. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Okay, so family, as we have seen today, we find ourselves in the gospel according to Matthew. Okay, the gospel of Matthew happens to be one of the earliest official written accounts about Jesus of Nazareth. It's one of the first earliest accounts of his life, his death, and his resurrection. Now, a couple of things to note. Matthew was a tax collector. He was one of the 12 followers whom Jesus appointed to follow him over the course of Jesus' three years of ministry before his crucifixion. And in this gospel account, Matthew wants to show his readers that Jesus is the continuation and fulfillment of of the whole biblical story about God and Israel, and that Jesus is the Messiah from the line of David. Family, Jesus is God with us. Now, God the Son, Jesus Christ, is a master teacher, okay? He's a master teacher. And some of his most well-known teachings are recorded in short stories called parables. And Jesus makes use of parables to invite people into what God is doing from a fresh and from a new perspective. He doesn't use them to teach abstract, lofty, or moral ideas. No, no, no. Instead, Jesus uses parables to announce and usher in the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. And so some 2,020-ish years ago, God's people, the Israelites, were ruled by the Roman Empire, right? But their scriptures promise that one day God would come to rule his people as king. And so many Israelites wanted to rally against Rome and fight for their freedom. And this is what many thought the arrival of the kingdom of God on earth would look like. But Jesus was not that kind of a promised king. At least not yet. By earthly standards, he was a poor, traveling prophet, healing the sick, inviting people to follow him. And he says that he, he himself was the arrival of God's kingdom, which very much did not conform to the popular expectations of the day, right? And so Jesus uses some parables to help people understand that he was, in fact, the arrival of God's kingdom on earth. Now, where we find ourselves today, or where we pick things up with Jesus is in Matthew 25, right? Where we find Jesus' last teachings before his last few days, just before his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Now in this chapter, Jesus tells three parables, back to back to back. And in these three parables, he's essentially answering a question that his followers, the disciples, asked him back a chapter earlier in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, where they basically asked Jesus, Jesus, what's the end of the world going to be like? Or what's it going to be like during the time when Jesus' followers on earth are awaiting his return from heaven? What's it going to be like for Jesus' followers on earth as they await his return from heaven? And so Jesus gives them a whole bunch of specific and very detailed instructions about predicted persecutions, the great tribulation, and the return of the Son of Man. But this is very weighty and detailed. And so Jesus then breaks it down for them 
for all his followers in three parables straight after one another, back to back to back. And remember, Jesus tells these three parables to answer the disciples' question, what will the end times be like as the world awaits for Jesus' return from heaven? In a similar way, Rooted Fellowship family, what is it going to be like for us now in Pretoria 2022 as we await Jesus' return? And so Jesus begins with the parable of the brides, Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. He begins with the parable of the brides. He then moves on to our text for today, the parable of the talents, and then he concludes with the parable of the sheep and goats. And at their simplest, at their very simplest, these three parables could be summarized as follows. The parables of the brides is, don't miss the gospel. Don't miss the gospel. The parable of the talents is, respond faithfully to the gospel. And the parable of the sheep and goats is, live out the gospel. Don't miss the gospel. Respond faithfully to the gospel. Live out the gospel. At Rooted Fellowship, we define the gospel or the good news as being the news that Jesus Christ came, lived the perfect life, died the perfect sacrificial death. He rose again, defeating sin and death. He ascended into heaven. He's coming back one day to make all things new, and we affirm him as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. The gospel. And in Matthew 25, Jesus says to his close followers, don't miss it. Don't miss the gospel. Live your life in faithful response to that, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, emulate that. And so, as we've seen already today, we're doing a deeper dive into that middle parable, the parable of the talents. Respond faithfully to the gospel. Somebody say, respond faithfully to the gospel. Everybody, respond faithfully to the gospel. And it's my prayer and it's my belief today that as a local church, we will find this message applicable to our lives. Amen? Okay. And so, let's take a deeper dive. We come to Matthew 25, verse 14. Matthew 25, verse 14. Jesus says, For it, for it, now it here refers to the end times or the time where we await the second coming of Christ. Okay? So, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called to his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. Verse 15, to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. And then he went on a journey. Now, as Jesus talks about the man or the master in this parable, he's in actual fact talking about himself. And Jesus then entrusts his servants or his followers All of us who profess to be Christians, he entrusts us with various gifts and resources. Now, according to Dr. Tony Evans, a talent at the time when Jesus spoke this parable was a maximum weight of value. Okay, that's what a talent is. A talent is a maximum weight of value or worth. It was a very, very large amount of money, okay? It was large in value, but it was also large in size. It would have taken up a lot of space. Let me, let me paint this picture for you. It was thought to be silver coinage of about 6,000 days or 20 years of wages. Silver coinage of 6,000 days, 20 years of wages. Scholars say that in today's terms, it was about 20 million rand. One talent, 20 million rand. So it's a fair chunk of change, okay? Fair chunk of change. Now, I want, you to, I want you to, if you can, I want you to imagine 20, ma- 20 million rand in silver coins here, one talent. And so here we have a man who goes on a journey and entrusts his servants with a very, very, very generous amount of resources, right? Along with the responsibilities that come with all of those resources. All of these resources are his. They're his but he generously and graciously entrusts his servants to be good and faithful caregivers or stewards over these resources. 
Another thing worth noting here, family, is that this man doesn't divide his possessions proportionately in equal fractions, right? We see that. He doesn't give out his eight talents in proportions of 2.67 to you, 2.67 to you, 2. No, 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 no. He divides it according to their abilities, according to their abilities. In other words, none of them receive more or less than they can handle. Family, some of us need to hear this. God is a just God. He's a just God, but he isn't going around giving every single one of his followers the exact same amount of everything so that everything, everyone gets everything in equal measure. He doesn't do that. No, no. Instead, he divides it lovingly and justly according to their abilities. But note this. His expectations are the same. His expectations are the same. In high school, I had a brilliant math teacher. Her name was Mrs. Peatfield. She was brilliant. She would sit for hours with those in the ad maths class, and she would sit for hours with those struggling to pass maths. She would give homework, and she would give exercises to those in the ad maths class, and she would give exercises to those struggling to pass maths. But her expectations were the same. She expected us to do our homework. She expected us to work excellently. And she rejoiced, family, when they got the, in the ad math class. I wasn't in that class. When they got their A, she rejoiced. And when those of us who were struggling just passed, she rejoiced. Her expectations were the same. And so in the same way that none of these servants received more or less than they could handle, none of them would have been overwhelmed in their responsibility of taking care of their talents. Instead, failing to look after their talents could only come from unfaithfulness on their parts. But we're going to come back to this a bit later. Okay? Now, family, whilst these talents literally, literally refer to monetary resources, picture our 20 million rand in silver coins here, Theologians such as Evans also agree that they also figuratively refer to all resources that God has so graciously entrusted to his followers. We say this every single week here at church. We say this. We believe that God has blessed us with time, talents, and treasures. He's given us time, treasures, and talents. And family, we are called to faithfully respond to the gospel We are called to faithfully respond to Jesus Christ who gave it all when he hung on that cross for our sins. We are called to faithfully respond to what he did for us by using our uniquely allotted time, our few designated treasures, and our specific few talents for his glory and for our good. Amen? That's what these three servants were called to do, and that's what we are called to do. And so let's take a closer look at what happens. Verse 16. Immediately, immediately, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. Notice this person's sense of urgency, fam, right? I think it's worth honoring the fact that this man does not know when the man whom he serves is coming back. But I mean, Jesus says he's going on a journey. And so this first man could have taken a day or two, right, to chill. And I don't think we would have begrudged him. But no, Jesus says immediately, He puts what he is entrusted to to work. It's no wonder that he is entrusted with five talents. Then in verse 17, it says, In the same way, the man with the two talents, the second man, earned two more. Now, family, notice what these two servants did not do. They didn't get together and have a time where they compared what Jesus had entrusted to them. There was no... Hey, man, how's it going? Good, good. How are you doing? Good. I see Jesus, uh, or your master, gave you some talents. Yeah, 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 he did. Um, Man, he's been so good to me. Hey, amen. He's been so good. I got two talents. Praise his name. Oh, man, that's that's really really lovely. I actually got five. (laughs) Hashtag humble brag. (laughs) They also didn't hop straight onto social media pick out the perfect filter and take pictures of what they were, were given, right? He says, oh, check me out here with my talents. They didn't bash one another in the comment sections. You didn't deserve that. You didn't earn that. They didn't compare themselves to one another. No, these two stewards, they faithfully picked up 
what God had entrusted into their lives and wisely got to work. To the unique call that God had entrusted them and only them with. And family, somebody needs to hear this today. I know I need to hear this today. Don't compare the hardest struggles of your life to the amazing highlight reel of someone else's social media persona. Do not compare the hardest struggles of your life to the amazing social media highlight reel of someone else's persona. It's not comparing apples and apples, and it's certainly not glorifying to God. Amen? Dr. Kevin Alko, a a Christian sports psychologist, says this. He says, there's no win in comparison. There is no win in comparison. In fact, Jesus speaks directly to comparing in John's gospel in chapter 21, verse 22. Peter asked Jesus about the other disciple, John, and Jesus replies, if I want John to remain alive until I return, what is that to you, Peter? You must follow me. You must follow me. Jesus is telling Peter to focus on his own relationship with Jesus, his own task that Jesus has called him to, and his own gifts and talents. And he's telling him not to compare these with other disciples and to not concern himself with or not worry about what Peter has and what Peter does not have. There's no win in comparison. These two servants in our parable today, they faithfully get to work. Contrast this, verse 18. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now let's be honest for a second. First time, very first time I heard this parable, I thought, gosh, that's not a bad idea. Right, verse eight, you come to verse 8 and you think, not bad. I mean, investing it could be risky. Could be risky, right? I mean, this guy is keeping his assets in precious metal. We don't know what the economy was like in the year zero, zero. And so I think if we're being honest, we, we often read this and we, our first reaction is we sympathize. We sympathize with this man. We see something of ourselves in him. He doesn't grow his resources, sure, but he doesn't lose them either, right? Not yet. Doesn't lose them yet. (laughs) Then some of us come to this parable and think, man, we think of this guy as lazy. And sure, that is something that Jesus is warning us against. In fact, he says as much in the upcoming verses. But rooted fellowship to us as a church today, to us as a church of highly competent, extremely busy and productive people, this morning I invite you to look at this parable in the following way. 20 million rand in silver coins is a lot of mass. It takes up a lot of space. And here the servant goes, and he digs up enough space to cover that. He then puts it, lowers it into the hole and covers it up with enough dirt to make sure that it is completely, completely hidden. And if you think about that, think about that time and the effort that that person does. Family, I'm going to put it to you this morning that that is not a physically lazy man. That is a foolishly busy man. That is not a physically lazy man. That is a foolishly busy man. This is not someone who doesn't want to get to work. I put it to you this morning that this is not someone who doesn't know what to do with what they've been given. This is someone who doesn't know what not to do with what they've been given. famous best practice business book called From Good to Great. Jim Collins writes this. He says, great leaders not only have a to-do list, but they have a to-don't list. And on this list, on this to-don't list, they don't write down the things that they are not good at. No. They write down the things that they are in fact gifted at, but should not be doing. And so... Perhaps this third man was a brilliant excavator and a fantastic gardener. But that's not what God had called him to do. That's not what he had been tasked with doing. And brothers and sisters, I ask you and I ask me this morning, what time, treasures, and talents has God given you? And what are you doing with them? But also, are you aware of what you should not be doing with them? 
Are you defaulting to what is safe and what comes easily or naturally to you? Or are you defaulting to something that is sinful and unhelpful with your time, treasures, and talents? Is it time to step out of our comfort zones and bring your time, your treasures, and your talents and offer them up to the Lord saying, Father, these are all yours anyways. And so, Lord, have your way in and through me. Family, every single thing that we have is a gift from God. We can boast of nothing apart from God. Jesus is saying in these four verses that God blesses his people with differing gifts, gives them different time, treasures, and talents according to their abilities. He gives some more, and he gives to others less. He's God. He can do that. He can do that, and he does do that. But family, whatever he gives, he wants us to use in response to what Jesus did for us. And what did Jesus do? Jesus paid it all. Amen? He gave it all. And so let's, let's do a, do a double click into these resources. Let's talk specifically about what he has given us. Let's look at treasures. We're going to talk about treasures. If God supplies us with money, which he does, well, he wants us to use our money in response to what Jesus did for us. Paul says to Corinthians that he wants us to give cheerfully to the work of growing his kingdom. And family, he wants us to give cheerfully in response to the gospel and not to give out of fear or guilt. I need to say that before I move on. Family, God wants us to give cheerfully in response to the gospel and to not give out of fear or guilt. Now, honestly, this is a sermon for another day, but do you know that tithing, okay, tithing, in other words, giving one-tenth to the work of the Lord, that is financial giving 101. It's the first paragraph in the introduction to Christian giving syllabus. It's the place from which a believer's financial giving starts from. And so, family, what are we doing with our money? What are we doing with our money? Growing up, one of my mentors said that if you want to see where a person's priorities lie, take a look at their bank statement. And so, family, I'll ask you, if you opened up our banking apps right now and had a look at what we spent our money on in this past month, what will that reveal about what we are doing with the money that God has blessed us with? What's the first thing to go out after we receive our paycheck? Another thing worth noting that is that in Jesus' day, they didn't have the credit card. But we do today. In fact, I have one coming letting you guys know that before I get into this part. I have one. But some of us are not only foolishly spending the money that God has entrusted us with, but we're even foolishly spending the money that he hasn't even entrusted us with. We are living way beyond our means, spending it on comforts that we cannot afford. And so this, when we do that, it makes it extremely difficult, if not near impossible, to give cheerfully and generously to furthering God's kingdom. That's why Mark 12, Jesus honors the widow who gave so, so much more than anyone else because her two tiny coins were so much more than anyone else's 10%. And in the words of our lead pastor, One, if I had time to unpack New Testament giving even further, I would, but we don't have the time, which brings us beautifully to our next resource, Time. Time. If you're here alive and breathing, family, the Lord has blessed you with time. Limited time. But time nonetheless. And so what are we doing with it? Christian brothers and sisters, Cory Ten Boom, the Christian writer said, we know this one, but we need to hear it again. If the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy. If the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy. What are you filling your life with? With the things that God is concerned about? <sighs> or are you busy, 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 busy? Are you joining God in his work? 
here in this local church? Are you plugged into this or perhaps another local church? Regularly participating in the gathering? Are you serving the family on a Sunday in the various ambassador departments? Are you part of a midweek family group? Are you discipling others and raising up leaders? Are you joining God in His work out there on mission, at home, at work, and at play? Are you sharing the good news with those whom you come into contact with? Brothers and sisters, what's the first thing you do in the day? What's your prayer life like? How much time do you spend in His Word each day? Is time spent working to recover and then recovering to work? Do we have time for our blood-bought family? Or are we always away for the weekend with our blood families? And before you say, John, when are we supposed to rest? I've got some good news. Jesus valued rest, amen? Jesus was never in a rush. And so as you look at your life, hear me, I'm not saying for go rest. God requires that that of us too. And so what are the other things that are taking away from your rest? What are the idols that we need to tear down that we may say, as Joshua said, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord? If you're feeling convicted around this, I know I am as I prepared for this this week. Can I encourage you to intentionally set aside some time tonight after this gathering to reflect on your life's rhythms? And what are you filling your life each day with? If you're struggling to prioritize the things that we're called to prioritize, God himself, why not reach out to a Christian brother or sister and ask them to help? We were not made for isolation. We want to walk this journey together. And when you're stuck in a cycle of busyness, it's often really hard to break that cycle. And inviting another voice into that process, a voice that loves Jesus and wants to support you to be all that God has created you to be, is a blessing. And then finally, what about our talents? What about our talents? What do we spend our precious, limited time on? Are we spending our time envying others' talents? Or are we putting our own talents to work within the family of God? If you're a teacher, are you teaching? Shepherds, are you shepherding? Evangelists, are you evangelizing? Prophets, are you speaking God's truth from his word into the situations that those around us are facing? Pioneers, are you continuing to break new ground? Are we exercising all that God has created us to be within the family of God? Or are we all just envying one another? Lord, why can't I have his gift? Why can't I have her gift? Or their life? Or their platform? Or their influence? If we're honest, fam, I think we desperately seek after others' fruitfulness whilst desiring nothing of their faithfulness to their own gifts and talents. We long for their fruitfulness and say nothing about their faithfulness to their own gifts and talents. Family, Christ does not give the same resources or the same amounts of resources to his followers. He doesn't give the same resources or the same amounts of resources to his followers. We've seen this already in his parable. Jesus does not give the same resources, the same amount of resources to his followers. And so he does not require us all to return the same equal amounts to him. But he does expect that we return to him all that we can. And so let's pick up the parable again, verse 19. See what happens. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were... Read this with me. Faithful over a few things. 
you were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Share your master's joy. Verse 22, the man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have earned two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You know what to do here? You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Friends and family, these two faithful servants were concerned with their master's concerns. They did not seek the approval of fellow men. They sought the approval of their master. Who are you seeking to please? When push comes to shove, whose approval are we seeking in this life? We see that these two men were rewarded because they had used their gifts wisely and well. And so as they had been faithful with a few things, they were put in charge of many things. Minka, Fritz, we want to honor you guys this morning. Minka, you've been faithful for 30 years. I pray that you go and enjoy that blessing of your retirement. Verse 24 and 25. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I knew you. You're a, you're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid. Notice that. I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. See what you have is yours. Again, foolishly busy because he would have had to dig that up and give it back. Not only has this man not been faithful to the few things that he was called to, but he then even accuses his master of being unjust. Which, of course, is not true, but even still, he tries to avoid responsibility for his unfaithfulness and offers the mere safe return of the talent as sufficient. And don't we do this too? Aren't we experts at justifying why we do or why we do not do something, even when we know we're wrong? Verse 26. His master replied to him, You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. And so here we have the master saying, if what you say is true, and even if I were a harsh man, which he is not, but even if it were true, then why didn't you at the very least deposit this talent in the bank? The point being, there is no excuse for this unfaithfulness family. There is no excuse for his unfaithfulness. And so, verse 28 and 29, he says, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Family, in, in, in anatomy, or well, sports science, I'm not too sure, but in that uh, world, there is something known as muscle atrophy. Muscle atrophy. It's when muscles begin to waste away, right? They stop growing. And on average, I'm, I'm sorry if this convicts you, this process begins at the age of 30. Okay? But don't worry, I've got good news. It's in addition to the fact that Jesus died for our sins. <laughs> atrophy is a big word. Okay? It's a big word. Essentially, it means this. And friends and family, if you remember one thing from our time today, I pray it's this. This is what muscle atrophy means. If you don't use it, you lose it. If you do not use it, you lose it. I was in a rock band growing up, and... Uh, 
started learning guitar to play in a band. That's, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in a band, so I, started, I picked up the guitar learning because I wanted to be in a, in a rock star band. Right? And so I used to practice every single day. I used to practice solos and all sorts of things. Uh, anybody Guns N' Roses fan here? They know Sweet Child of Mine? Yeah. Anyways, um, I could play that, and I could play it pretty well. Uh, and on some Sunday mornings here, when it's a bit cold, I, I bring out the acoustic guitar and I try and do it. I just can't do it anymore, man. And the reason being is because I'm not doing it every single day. If you don't use it, you lose it. However, I have good news in addition to the fact that Jesus died for our sins. If you use your muscles, you can continue to grow these into the later years of your life. Jesus is saying, if we do not use our time, our talents, and our treasures, family, they will be taken from us and given to someone else who is faithfully using theirs. God will continue to build his church. Amen? The church is rocked after scandal after scandal at this moment in time, but God continues to build his church when one, one mega church goes down, God will raise up other faithful people. Amen? Paul writes in his first letter to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 14, he says this. He says, Timothy, do not neglect your gift. In other words, Timothy, don't use or misuse your gift for selfish gain. Use it for the Lord. And then finally, Jesus concludes the parable for today in verse 30. He says this. And now throw this good-for-nothing servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Throw this good-for-nothing servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm going to start to wrap up here and land the plane, so I'm going to invite the band to come up. But family, as we reflect on that verse, I want us to know this. When we do not use a gift from God that has been graciously entrusted to us, we cheat God. When we do not use a gift from God that has been graciously entrusted to us, we cheat God. Many of us think, oh, I can do so little for God we use it as an excuse. But as we've seen from our parable today, there is no excuse. As we've seen in our series on Judges, we see this right throughout Scripture. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Amen? God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Now, this is super important. Okay, I'm going to camp out here for a little, just a little while. But the band can start up. <laughs> Remember, in this parable, Jesus is talking about his followers and their different responses to the call. He's not talking about those who have rejected him. He deals with those people in the previous parable, in verses 1 to 13 of Matthew 25. But here, in the parable of the talents, Jesus is speaking about his followers and their different responses to the time, treasures, and talents that he has entrusted them and us with. And so this third man's response, or rather his lack of faithful response to the gospel, is not a heaven and hell issue. We need to hear this. We cannot earn salvation through works. Amen? We cannot earn salvation through works. It is only through faith in Jesus that we are saved. That's the gospel that we profess our faith in. And so in verse 30, this does not imply that this man will be thrown into hell. Contrarily, it actually, scholars say that it, it rather refers to the forfeiting of some of a person's heavenly rewards. With the weeping and gnashing of teeth reflecting a believer's remorse for the loss of some of their heavenly rewards. And so what does all of this mean? I'm sure many of y'all are wondering, okay, so Jono, are you saying that we should all quit our jobs in order to serve God? I'll let the Holy Spirit lead and convict. <laughs> Not necessarily. Not necessarily, but maybe. But it does mean that we are to use our time, our talents, 
and our treasures diligently in order to serve God completely in whatever we do. And so for a few people, this could mean changing professions. But for all of us, all of us, it means living out our daily lives out of sheer devotion and love for God. Amen? And then family, don't miss it. I heard, I heard a pastor once say this. God is a just God. Amen? Yeah. And the degree to which we embrace the task that God has entrusted us to by wisely using our time, our talents, and our treasures will be linked to the degree to which we will enjoy the heavenly gifts of eternity. The degree to which we embrace what God has called us to will be the degree to which we enjoy the heavenly rewards to come. Now, you may be thinking, what's it with this church? They're always reminding us about giving of our time, our talents, and our treasures, and getting plugged into community. They're always reminding us not to neglect the Sunday gathering. They're always pushing us to get plugged into a midweek gathering to serve the disciple, to serve and be discipled. And you'd be right. We do this for a number of reasons. One, we're a forgetful people and we need to be reminded. Pastor Ones says this all the time. Forgetfulness leads to unfaithfulness. But we also do this because we want you to participate in the life of this local family so that you may be like the first and second servant. And family, it's our prayer that one day when we as the followers of Jesus come to stand before him to give an account for what we did with our allotted time, treasures and resources, that he will say to us as he said to those first two servants, well done, good faithful servant you were faithful over a few things you were faithful over the few years I gave you on earth you were faithful over the few financial resources I entrusted you with you were faithful with the few talents I blessed you with and so now come into my kingdom and partake in my joy and I will put you in charge over many 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 more things. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over the few things. Let's pray. Let's stand and pray and respond to this message. Father God, we thank you that you are a faithful God. Lord God, Lord Jesus, that you, in the same way that you call us to be faithful, Lord God, you were faithful first. You are a faithful Lord and Savior. And so, Lord God, you do not call us to something which you have not gone to. We praise you for your faithfulness, for your goodness and your grace. We thank you, Lord God, that you are a just God who blesses us and invites us into what you're doing. We want to be where you're at work, Lord God. And so I pray for us now, Lord God. I pray for us as your people here at Rooted Fellowship. May we be a people who honor our time, our treasures, and our talents. May we, we, may we be wise about what we do and do not do. Give us your discernment. Help us to reflect on our lives, Lord God, and speak truth. Lord God, where we need to change professions, where we need to change schedules, may we do this in the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that we would give up more of our time, treasures, and talents. That we may be a people who others look to to say, that's God on mission. We want to join them in that. But once again, Lord God, we thank you for Jesus who calls us to this life to follow him. May we keep our eyes firmly focused on you and our, on our specific walk and relationship with you, Lord Jesus. May we encourage one another to live out our faith, to respond faithfully to what you have called us to, to be faithful over the few things for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.